Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Okay, so you can find me on YouTube at The Obsidian Archives. You could like follow me on Twitter at Team Obsidia. It has an underscore between Team and Obsidia. And most importantly, look up the Obsidian Archives on Patreon. That is pretty much like the fuel to the engine, basically. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented creator of an animated series based on some amazing D&D style characters. We're joined by the ever-talented and creator of the Obsidian Archive, Samuel Wilkinson. How are you doing today? Hello, how you been? Doing good, doing good. I love series like this because it's a fresh batch of characters that I've never seen. It's a world that I've never interacted with in what I normally consume media-wise. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Do Geek Stalking. Okay, so I am a uh, British-based uh, animator from uh, like the Essex region. I specialized in a lot of 3D animation back in the day, but uh, I slowly grew a passion for um, D&D. I had a campaign that ran for about like one or two years, but basically at a certain point after all the world building, I was like, okay, I think I have enough stuff here to like possibly build like an actual fantasy universe. And that's where the Obsidian Archives takes place. The Obsidian Archives is a YouTube series, which has a lot of animatics that help flesh out and present like the characters and the historical events in this fantasy universe. It is kind of uh, pseudo-historical. It is very, you're hearing it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. It jumps back from like the modern to the medieval times and vice versa. Looking at this YouTube series that you have created or this animated series, I should say here, and you mentioned your passion for animation in the, in the past as well, too. How's the reaction been to bringing your campaigns to life in this style? Well, the people that have actually taken part in the campaign, uh, it's been like mostly positive. I mean, sometimes you, you know, you, you start a D and D campaign and sometimes things get a little bit too wild for some people's taste, but like, like the people that like stay around are like, were already there for the campaign are already there for the animations. I have like several people that have yet to make their character like appearances in the larger narrative. But I think what makes this series interesting is that it isn't being told from the perspective of the actual uh, heroes of the D&D campaign, but it's actually the authoritarian government that's been trying to take over their continent in a kind of historical British empire kind of setting. History is always wonderful to not only re revisit for either ideas, but also to look back and see if past mistakes are being repeated in present day for that matter. I, I always find a fascination with history. Yeah, of course. Uh, I take a lot of influence from uh, George Orwell's uh, 1984. Uh, when you start up watching the Obsidian Archives, you notice that you're not like right into the action immediately, but rather you are in the shoes of a person known as the curator, which is basically a, like a low ranking role in um, the archives, like actual institute. Uh, Obsidian has many different like branches of government and you're probably in one of the most safest positions while also from a safe distance seeing the actual uh, horrors that your own government may or may not secretly be up to like right between the lines of the text basically. When you were putting together this campaign and going through the world of the Obsidian archives that, that you navigated here, what was an event that kind of brought all of your characters together in uh, most unexpected ways. Well, okay, for a little bit of context, the world of the actual campaign that I ran was a place called the Runic Knights of Runegard, and that was like a Scandinavian kind of no no like Norse legend with like Vikings and like Norse gods and all that jazz. Halfway through, they are greeted by a mysterious third faction known as Obsidia, which is kind of modeled somewhere between like Europe and the British Empire. There's a lot of muskets, but they're basically very uh, anachronistic in terms of presence, but that just makes them more threatening for the fact that, oh, they don't 
know about magic, but they have like loads of like guns and, you know, TNT and stuff. We did have a small campaign where we had a few extra players from Australia play as some Skaven. Like we did a, a bit of like a Warhammer-esque kind of thing where they kind of were like enlisted in Obsidia, but it was all about like betrayal and backstabbing and it kind of revealed like what an evil campaign could look like. It gave me a lot of time to flesh out all the characters that were around them and the kind of intrigue they would be up to on the internal like government, you know, betrayals and stuff. What type of genre is this? It is something akin to what Game of Thrones probably has going. Oh. So it'd be a bit of medieval intrigue, a little bit of pseudo historical, you know, event telling kind of oh. not not really biopic, but definitely like it's trying to present a type of history, if that makes sense. You're building a world with from a different timeline, basically. Yes. Uh it, it does it does take a little bit of inspiration while taking some wild directions, especially with the implementation of the fact that it's a fantasy universe, so like magic is a thing, so that kind of fact factors it in as well. What's the most misunderstood aspect about the fantasy genre that maybe people who don't follow it misunderstand? I believe that in the fantasy genre, sometimes the thing is fantasy is kind of niche because when you make a regular movie, you usually have one or two changes to the current reality and that's about it. So it might be, oh, it's our reality, but oh, Superman's real when he flies and he shoots lasers or some shit, you know? With the Obsidian Archives, we basically take reality and we completely remix it to a different context with influences from both mythology, but also the fantasy genre. I don't know like who should take full credit for that, but like I think Tolkien's very influential when it comes to fantasy writing and stuff. A little bit of science fiction could also be kind of thrown in, you know, depending what kind of method it is. The why I like to design my fantasy is that it could be explained with science if you have just the right kind of stethoscopes, basically. So it's kind of like uh, the, the old video game like Arcanum and things like that, where it's a blend of magic and science and technology. Yes, Arcanum is uh, very influential. That and Carnival Row. Like, yeah. I watched a bit of Carnival Row and I saw, I saw, like, you know, the pact and all the different, like, factions and stuff. And I thought it was somewhat interesting what they did with it, though I think sometimes things get a little abrupt in the way the politics just kind of shift like on a dime a little yeah that's awesome like, i have to watch second season of carnival row i haven't had a chance to, to watch yet but i've heard i watched all of season one i binge watched it was amazing it's a shame because the show's got cancelled and they only have like season two to go through it so it's gonna be kind of like the story on like fast forward mode basically yeah well i guess i have to read the books <laughs> oh oh that's the worst part it's not based on any books what Oh. I know! It, it, like, <laughs> imagine you make it. I mean, then again, I shouldn't talk because I've lit I'm literally like making it like off off the seat of my pants, basically. You at least have more to go. It's not like you've stopped, you know. So it's like you have oh, yeah. like, all of these characters in the, this world that you built. You have a lot of different episodes and different avenues from what I saw on your YouTube channel, which was really well done and really amazing. Here, when you started doing the YouTube channel, though. What was your knowledge in putting together, not only from the animation side of things, but also promoting the channel as well too, to reach the masses? So this has been kind of like the trickiest thing. Basically, if you know of a guy called Nightmind, he covers a lot of ARG related content. ARGs are kind of cursed. On the one hand, they make arguably the best stories of all time just given the level of complexity, nuance and subtle clues. But on the flip side, by design, they are so niche that their fan bases are borderline pocket sized unless they're like either Marble Hornets or Mandela Catalog. The Obsidian Archives started off sort of like an ARG. It was meant to be, it's a story, but it's kind of told in first person. So like you, you, you feel like you're in the action and you're like an observer to the actual events. But unfortunately at the same time, like when you start an original IP, you have to like build it from the ground up. So it's not like a thing that could like kind of grow overnight. Fortunately, we are getting very close to like 1K subscribers though. So I'm kind of looking forward to that, you know. That's always a challenge, especially when you have media and entertainment along this line. That's more of a long form content compared to all the short form that's out there. Oh yeah, of course, of course. You said some of the characters haven't been introduced yet. Well, who are some of the characters, if you want to name them, of the campaign that are going to make appearances or have made appearances? Throughout the series, there's been a lot of mentions of kobolds. That's been kind of like a bit of a, a motif background, I think. I actually have some art here, a little bit grim dark. It was presented in one of the analog horror sections. So what we have here is, this is a bit of a double-edged tragedy. 
I won't go into like the full details of like how this came to be, but effectively during a great winter where the Obsidian people were starving, their crown prince literally had to make a very, very horrific concession where they would eat the kobolds, basically. But like all like sins don't like go unpunished in this universe. And basically there would be a line of kobolds that will cause trouble for um, Obsidian like later down the line. One of which being one of the D&D characters, Keem Bairnuf, who is a kobold bard, who was constantly on the run from Obsidia, but he eventually like gains the like courage to like fight back and all that jazz. So this is a bit of a mythological like tapestry piece here. Yeah, I love the art. I love the the overall storylines uh, that we have here. But let's let's talk about the the story, how the story has evolved so far. Where are we currently in the storyline, at least on the YouTube channel? Okay, so the situation is that the Imp and the Prince was kind of meant to be like the first story arc, but the problem was the production on making a single one of these episodes was really dramatic, and we had different artists doing different things. But effectively, The Imp and the Prince is about like halfway done, give or take. We've already like published three episodes on that. And that is like straight up like the origin story on the dynamic trio, which is Milan, Zeria, and D. Milan is meant to be kind of like an anti hero, Walter White esque, begrudging like monarch who's trying to balance between power and responsibility. A lot of it is about like the harsh realities of actual medieval statecraft and the practicalities that the compassionate option may be the least practical. And sometimes it could actually be very dangerous if you don't do it right. So, so this is like the main duo. The idea, it's meant to be about a little princess from hell teaming up with a mortal human tyrant known as Melan. Although I, I like to rhyme very three-dimensionally and complex. It's less about him doing bad things and more about him kind of explaining himself and him begrudgingly explaining how he can't do the option that the other characters wish he could do. It's like a sense of frustration. Vengeance kind of takes a big chunk of the story, but not like an individual like one person has a gripe with another person but like an entire culture imagine a bunch of humans being oppressed by like goblins with guns only for the humans to finally get the guns and now the boots on the other foot so to speak it's a very bleak thing with no simple answers basically it tries to think outside the box in presentation basically give us the rundown of of the characters of the Obsidian Archives so that we can latch on to okay. our favorites in the future. Okay, so the main character is a guy called Milan. He lost his mother just before the invasion of Silica and it's him wrestling conscience to be a good leader, but also like being like a, like a firm like lawmaker. Uh, he is assisted by a, a cute little short uh, imp she-demon known as Zeria who formerly worked in like the last ring of uh, hell, but decided to kind of like abandon her old gig to basically be uh, a princess in like the mortal realm. So it's kind of a subversion of the Disney trope. Mm -hmm. you, you know, when you have like, a little mermaid and she's like singing, oh, to be a princess, oh, you mm -hmm. know, like that. But this is like a demon who, who will suck your soul out basically. <laughs> And the last of the three is a very wonderful little annoyance known as D who was formerly a, a demon lord who gets like shrunk down because of a silver chandelier, like a little imp kind of emerges from his corpse. Mm. It is a bit of a joke that he's kind of held prisoner, but he's more like lazy couch guest. <laughs> Most of his spiel is he will constantly make sex jokes. He's a very raunchy mofo. <laughs> Do you enjoy writing complex themes with your characters into the stories you've created? Absolutely. I think both character conflict, but also like certain levels of historical nuance is very valid. Think of Vlad the Impaler, for example. All right. Like on the one hand, he's an absolute mad psycho who impaled a load of people on spikes. On the flip side, however, he also defends the nation of Wallachia from the encroaching Ottoman Empire. It's like, like what do you do with him exactly? You know, it's amazing to see here in what are the upcoming stories that you have that are either about to be completed or in the process of being completed? Okay, well, we'll have good news. So this Wednesday, we're actually uh, tackling one of the acquaintances of Milan. Sometimes I don't like to have a person just introduce themselves as the story goes, but rather have the characters have prior history so it feels more like a lived-in kind of place. Because a lot of uh, movies, they like to design it where there's a present 
and there's a future, but they sometimes forget that like everything they do technically needs to have a past. This story is Milan. He meets this character. This character gains some sort of incredible power at a cost. And it's more about the practicalities of kind of bridging the gap between the natural and the supernatural in terms of camaraderie in the most broadest terms that I could put it, basically. <laughs> Without spoiling it, obviously. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do enjoy spoilers. It's also fun seeing the journey of the channel and of these characters as well, too, because old school television, before we could binge watch everything, you had to wait every week or so to get your favorite episode or series. Exactly. Technically, the way it's designed is the longer it goes on for, the more rich the rabbit hole is. It's less about trying to chase it. And more like, you know, when you think enough's made, you kind of like dive in and go, okay, so let's see what's like going on with this rabbit hole. What kind of law, what kind of history, what kind of factions are introduced? I have like a lot planned and a lot of it will hopefully definitely get made. I'm already in production and the full part of the Imp of the Prince that will add an, like an extra layer between the relationship with the characters. But I also have like one or two other scripts that will introduce a few other characters that will flesh out the geography of the map. You're adding great elements to the story and the world building that you're creating especially in this visual medium that is out there. What challenges have you had to face in terms of creating this series to get it to the masses? So in, in my line of work, especially when you're like the sole creator of a product, sometimes you try and experiment with which communities would be receptive on the content being presented. But sometimes you get some communities that like have a complete lockdown on who's running which community and where. If there's like a certain thing that you don't match on a, on a tick box or whatever, that can greatly hamper your ability to both promote and broadcast what it is that you're trying to broadcast. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice that you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? I think the second best advice that's ever been given has kind of stuck with me, but it's more of a wrestle than an actual uh, doctrine. It is like sometimes don't make it the thing, but make it like the thing. And that is in regards to like allegory and subtext. Sometimes when I like design a character or a nation or a theme, I like to base it off something that is existent in reality, so to speak. I don't have any examples that I could say for the Obsidian Archives, but in our D&D campaign, this was all the way back in like the 2016 era. We had like a campaign in like an ancient Greece kind of setting, and we had King Midas, and I literally just made Midas uh, Donald Trump because <laughs> I like... I like doing the impression. I'm like, oh, I'm King Midas. I'm the best king of Tyrannus. Everyone's been saying it. I'm making a big golden wall. It's going to be nice and shiny. It's going to be huge. Because the series are really bad impressions, basically. But sometimes you should be careful when you make a thing about a person because one day a person might be like hunky dory. The next moment, to be put bluntly, they could get like cancelled for saying really obscene. And you're like, oh, ah, yeah, Christ, I, I kind of did a reference there. Oh, you know, and it, it gets kind of awkward. I had like a show that had a president that was kind of like Kevin Spacey. Mm. And then immediately, just as the thing was about to be released, the whole thing kind of unraveled. And it's like, oh, what? For real? Oh, man. You know? It's a fine line to... Gather Be careful with your references, basically. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? When I saw a video essay describing the real terrors of 1984, it wasn't all the, the rat boxes or the seizures, but rather it was the fact that they have dominated the language to the point that they do not know the, the words to articulate the kind of freedom of which they want to re regain. What we do have is a Patreon, however, which I think is a lot more efficient. Like, you know, you, you, you latch on when you want to latch on. And, you know, if you want to like invest in other stuff, you can like kind of like switch when you want to and come back later. It's, um, it's a lot more free form. The Patreon is the, you should just be able to like type in the Obsidian Archives and it should show up. At the moment, we have like four people um, donating at the moment. So that's, that's really um, wholesome, yeah. you know, up and up and all that jazz. If you go to www.patreon.com slash the Obsidian Archives, you should be uh, good to go. I'm actually planning to make a playlist where everything's oh, cool. in chronological order, but I, I, I want to make it once that like the Imp and the Prince is actually done. So then I could like lay it out like properly. Nice. Okay. Good. You're, you're on your way to keep yourself organized. That's usually the hardest part. <laughs>
I mean, is if you go to like the playlist system, like everything's like divided by like narrator and what they cover, and all the playlists are definitely in order. So like, oh, you you you, you know, you want to see this guy's storyline, like go through, you know, like that. It reinvents the wheel with YouTube a little. Uh, it it basically uses YouTube's internal systems to like kind of min max itself almost. Like if you if you go to like a hub video, you would have the videos kind of like flow around at the end. So like you go, oh, okay, so these are in relation to this. So I click on you know. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? Oh man, where to begin? Where to begin? I think maybe Kojima. I call into the Metal Gear Solid phase right at the tail end with uh, MGSV. But to be like perfectly honest, like the way he would make this hyper complex law and it would constantly have twists and turns with all like the mech suits and the uniform designs. That's like a hundred percent what I'm like in for. From a professional standpoint, you have turned a amazing D and D campaign into an animated series here, and you're doing it very well successfully in that regard. And you're showcasing it to the masses professionally. You're successful putting this all together. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I feel like I'm getting there, but I feel like it's it's almost like a milestone that you kind of have to reach. I think my milestone for success would be when we make it to like the 10K mark, I guess. That's completely shallow. I'd say the real success is every time someone asks a load of questions about it, which basically means that it has caught their interest to the point that they feel like they need to ask questions about this world. It's to the point that it actually matters to them. And they keep following and they keep sharing it and everything like that. Yeah, you want you want them to share their passion for what they've just seen to showcase it with others. Absolutely. It's what we all want. True. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Usually the fail state for me is getting into a space that isn't like entirely receptive to what I'm about or whatever. But usually when a failure like that happens, yeah, it does kind of suck the life of me a little, but it also kind of invigorates me with a level of spite, which is like, hey, listen, if you're not down for what I'm doing right now, I'm just going to do it somewhere else and around you and I will ensnare. I'll just make my presence just 10 times more known elsewhere. It's like a game of risk. Build up on Papua New Guinea every single round and take over the world? Y yeah, pretty much. Uh, Eddie is a favorite of mine, so I, I love her. Work. Oh, yeah, absolutely funny. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as an animator, a writer, or turning a campaign into an amazing series like you've created. They are inspired in some way, shape, or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? If you want to inspire people, here's what you do. Find what the rules are and just break them. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a fan of postmodernism, but what is modern and what isn't is usually up to who currently holds uh, power. If you want to create something that goes against the status quo, absolutely do it wholeheartedly, and hopefully enough people will grow a taste for what you're putting down. If your life was a comic book, animated series, TV show, or whatever medium you like to consume, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? So my, my life would literally be a comic called The Artist or something. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like, it's a little bit generic, but like it definitely has a guy who's very passionate about creative works. The soundtrack to my life would definitely be maybe like one of those somber anime like EDs or whatever, but like very uh, introspective, you know? All right. What's your favorite in introspective anime? I, okay, this is going to sound generic as all hell. Attack on Titan really knocked it out the park. Yeah. I think compared to a lot of other shows, they actually bothered to do world building. They don't completely marry itself to what it's like about on a marketing level, but rather what it's about on a thematic level. Mm -hmm. I think that takes a lot of courage. Like, could you imagine like you're watching a series of like, lord of the rings but then it's like oh actually they're in a simulation and they like it turns out to be a deconstruction of aragon's journey of what it really means to be king or some nonsense like that that would be you know i mean that's attack on titan in a nutshell well samuel i do hate to say but that is this particular episode of two geeks talking i want to thank you so much for coming on the show it's been an absolute pleasure man i, I hope you get out
we'll guess in the future, my dude. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we find you online in this wide world of the internet? So you can find me on YouTube at The Obsidian Archives. The Obsidian Archives begins with a the, just so we're clear, not to get confused with like anything that just has Obsidian Archives. You could like follow me on Twitter at Team Obsidia. It has an underscore between Team and Obsidia. And most importantly, look up the Obsidian Archives on Patreon. That is pretty much like the fuel to the engine, basically. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. But since the website's going through a revamp, you can find everything on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back and you can find that at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or search for Two Geeks Talking on any of your audio streaming service. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.